All right, welcome to our Bible overview. We finished Judges last time, so now we're in the book of Ruth. And here's my account, my uh, Grace Preacher humor for the title, Amazing Ruth. Grace ain't the only one amazing. So uh, we're going to go through Amazing Ruth. And what is significant about Ruth is where we ended in Judges. If you read, you read the last verse in Judges and the first verse in Ruth. Uh, we saw last time, you know, we went through Judges 17 through 21, those five chapters. Uh, a lot of people don't go through Judges, so uh, I wanted to go through that, and you could see how bad it got, that Israel was a lot like Sodom, that uh, you had a very similar story of what happened with, with Lot and Sodom, as you do here, uh, where we saw yes, um, last week in Judges. And so here's the problem in Judges is if you are a, if you believe in God, what are you going to do? You know, you think of today, um, we are right dividing Bible believers. Most people aren't. But in a way it's okay because we've got the Holy Ghost within us. We've got God's complete preserved word. We've got the mind of Christ. So even if you're the only one, you've got all three members of the Godhead to teach you the sound doctrine and Christ can live in you, even if you don't know anybody else who believes this. But if you're back in the Judges, you got a problem because one, Israel has a fleshly covenant and God met with them in the temple, not in, well, the, I mean, the temple wasn't made, so the synagogue, basically, that was in Shiloh, he met with them there, not, he wasn't indwelling them. They didn't have God's completed preserved word. The word of God they had was to be read to them by the Levitical priest. But um, if the priests aren't doing what's right and they're teaching their traditions, what are you going to do? It seems like you could be... So here you see all the evil that's going on in the book of Judges, and it really seems like a dire situation. You look at that last verse in Judges, Judges chapter 21 and verse 25. In those days there was no king in Israel... Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So what are you going to do if you are a Bible-believing uh, person trusting in God to save you and Sodom and Gomorrah is going on there in the nation? I mean, Israel is supposed to be God's holy nation. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah stuff is going on. Uh, the Levite priest, how are you going to go to them? You see the house of Micah set up and then the Danites steal the house of Micah and those gods. So where are you going to go to hear God's word? Um, and it just seems like there is no hope, basically, is what it seems like. And so, really, the book of Ruth is there to show you the hope that God has not forgotten Israel, that even though you see all this great evil that we've seen in the times of the judges, uh, Israel is still God's people, there is still a believing remnant, and God will save them. That's the message of Ruth. Um, you get to Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass... In the days when the judges ruled. So you can see this is parallel to the chronology, chronologically speaking, of judges. So while there's nothing good going on, everybody did what was right in their eyes, there's still a believing remnant. And we're going to see that with Ruth. In fact, Ruth, um, basically what Ruth represents, I mean, Ruth is a real woman and uh, was there, but. Um, What's important about her and why I call her amazing is because Ruth represents believing Israel. Ruth represents believing Israel that will come out of the apostate nation. So even though you got all this bad stuff going on in the book of Judges, all the great wicked and evil, they're like Sodom and Gomorrah in many respects, you still have a faithful believing remnant there, and, um, and God will save them. When, um, when I was looking for someone, I was on eHarmony, and that's where I met Lana, um, they had back then, I don't know what they do now, this is when, 15 years ago, I guess, um, I was on there, they had, it, they had specific steps that you'd go through. So the first step when you have a match is you would just answer five short, five multiple choice questions, I think it was. They'd send you five and you'd send them five and you had to select from their list. 
And then the second step, if you still want to correspond with this person, the second step was you would send short answer questions and you could write a couple sentences to answer them. And that was, um, and you had to pick from a list. But then when you got to the third step, you made up your own short answer questions. And then they, they could write up to, I think up to a paragraph or so to answer them. So what I always did, if I got to the third step, was my first short answer question to the lady was, pick a book of the Bible and summarize it for me. Uh, because I wanted to make sure, I figured I wouldn't find a right divider, but at least this would eliminate the people who don't read the Bibles. You know, the people who claim to be Christians, and uh, I probably got to that step of maybe six or seven ladies, I would think, but every single one of them picked either Ruth or Esther to summarize. And Lana did too. I forget which one she picked. I think it was Ruth. Um, so it seems like because Ruth and Esther are two women that stand out in the Old Testament there, um, for whatever reason, women like these books, I think. so, uh, And that's probably why. So, uh, it's, so I think women probably are more familiar with the book of Ruth than men are. Uh, but it's important for all of us because it shows hope for Israel in the midst of an apostate nation. And while today the situation is different, we've got God in, within us rather than in a temple. We've got God's completed word. We've got the Holy Ghost to teach it to us. We've got the mind of Christ to understand it. We don't have to go to a temple where God is going to be. We don't have to rely upon priests to give us an accurate reading or interpretation of God's word. Um, it's still, we are still sort of like that. We are this believing remnant among a bunch of unbelievers. And we can take hope in the story of Ruth that even in a worse situation, uh, God saves his people and it's seen in type by Ruth. And so we can take encouragement in that, that even though the world just seems like it's all going to be lost, we do know that there will be a rapture and that we will, the body of Christ will be in heaven for all eternity. So Ruth is a good uh, example for us to see that. But of course, this is Jewish in nature. Uh, the basic thing, to, and we'll go through the, the chapters here and probably take at least a couple of weeks to go through it because it is an important story. But basically, so Ruth, uh, again, these are real people that are in here, but they're going to be representing, giving basically a picture to, for Israel to understand that even though they see all this wickedness going on in the time of the judges, they know that God is looking out for them and will deliver them. So the main characters to understand is Ruth represents believing Israel and then Boaz uh, represents Jesus Christ. In the end, uh, Boaz and Ruth are married and in the end, Jesus is going to marry his bride, Israel. Uh, so this is a great type and as we go through, we'll see more and more correlations we can make with that, the literal events here to what Jesus and believe in Israel are as the bride and as the bridegroom. And so that gives great encouragement for those during the times of the judges. So first off in verse 1, uh, it says, Ruth 1.1, 1, 1, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. So right there you learn with the famine, that is, we went through those five cycles of chastisement, Leviticus 26, a while back, and the famine uh, happened there in the days of the judges. That represents they are under the first cycle of chastisement at this time. Uh, as represented by that famine. And then uh, you go on and it says, And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now that's also, that's showing the apostasy of Israel there because Moab, and we'll probably won't get to that tonight, but when we get to Ruth chapter 4, we'll go into it. Moab was under, uh, Moab was, of course, one of the Canaanite nations. They were under a curse. They were cursed uh, by God. They could not go into the temple. They could not enter the temple or 
you know, the synagogue, whatever you want to call it there. They didn't really have the temple officially built. In fact, to see that um, right away, look in Nehemiah 13. Nehemiah, so Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, and then Psalms. Uh, Nehemiah, the last chapter in Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 13. Um, and it is the, and I'll go ahead and give you a spoiler alert here. I'll go ahead and tell you um, what ends up happening is Ruth is a Moabitess. And she ends up having a child. And through her lineage comes David, who is the king, King David. The Moabites, so David is related to the Moabites, going back to Ruth. And the curse on the Moabites goes for 10 generations. It was for 10 generations. So it could not enter the temple for 10 generations. And the 10th generation ends with David. So David is the first in that line that can actually enter the temple. And we'll get to that in uh, Ruth chapter 4. But you see here in Nehemiah 13, uh, and it tells you this, Nehemiah 13, verses 1 and 2. Nehemiah 13, verse 1 says, On that day they read in the book of Moses and the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite, they're reading Deuteronomy 31, that the Adam, Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. It's actually 10 generations there. Because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hire Balaam against them that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. He turns the curse into a blessing through Ruth, being that Moabitess. Uh, she is now part of the believing remnant, really. Um, even though she was a Gentile, a Moabitess under the curse. And what it shows you there is just because the Gentiles were on the wrong side of the middle wall partition doesn't mean that God doesn't love them and doesn't mean that God wouldn't save them if they uh, came to God in the, in the prescribed way, as Ruth does. Rahab is another example in James chapter 2. She is commended to be, she says she's justified by faith plus works there in James 2, put on the same level as Abraham, even though Rahab was a Gentile prostitute. So being on the right side of the middle wall of partition, being a Jew, has its advantages. But it doesn't mean that God did not love the Gentiles, uh, nor does it mean that they could not be saved. And Ruth is a great example of that. And what's great about that is it shows that, um, you know, it, it, and when we get to Ruth 4, you'll see that it says, You're, you are to Naomi a better daughter-in-law than seven sons would be. And it's basically showing God is interested. He's not a racist. He's not just going to say, I'm only saving Jews. But he's interested in someone who comes to him, recognizes their sin, and believes the gospel that God has given them, and God will bless them, even if they are under a curse, the Moabite curse here, or if they're a Gentile under the, on the wrong side of the middle wall of partition. Ruth is both, and yet she's blessed greater than if Naomi had seven sons, meaning full-fledged blooded Jews. So it shows that what God is looking for is the heart to recognize your sin and trust in God to save you rather than just the physical bloodline. And that's a, a good lesson from, uh, from the book of Ruth. Okay, so uh, with that in mind then, uh, we'll continue. Uh, so the question is, you know, in Ruth 1.1, 1, 1, here's this man of Bethlehem, Judah, who goes into the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The question is, why is he doing this? If God told Israel, you are my people, I'm giving you the land, don't intermingle with all these other nations, uh, why is he doing this? Well, it shows you, going back to Judges 21, 25, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And it's actually sort of a reverse of what God said. God says Israel, he gave Israel favor nation status, and he said... He said, don't marry foreign women, women of other nations. They're called strange women in the, in the Bible there in the King James. Don't marry foreign women because they will turn your heart to other gods. You see, that was Solomon. Solomon served the Lord. Then he got a thousand wives 
And now he's building temples to these other gods. So that's a good, um, that's a good warning. But when Israel is in apostasy and they're like Sodom, for in the case of Ruth, the opposite happens. So Israel's favorite nation, they aren't supposed to intermingle with these other nations because then the women will get them to serve other gods. But what ends up happening is this man here in Ruth 1.1, 1, 1, it doesn't tell you um, what he did, you know, if he served God or not, but you got to assume that if he left Bethlehem Judah, by the way, Bethlehem Judah is where Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Why would you leave the favor nation, God's people, the promised land, what people today call the holy, the holy nation or they call it the holy city. They call Jerusalem the holy city. Why would you leave the holy city or the holy nation of God to go to Moab, which was under a curse, it's Gentiles under a curse, and God says, don't marry those foreign, foreign women, they'll lead you to other gods. Well, the reason is because this guy, apparently, doesn't tell you, but apparently, since he's disobeying the law, he's not trusting in God. So here, you've got in Ruth 1.1, 1, 1, you've got an Israelite serving other gods, probably, that's assumed based on that. And then you've got Ruth. Ruth is a Moabitess, so they were forbidden in the law to marry somebody like that under the curse. And yet, here's Ruth, and let's get the verse here, what she says. Um, verse 16, Ruth said to Naomi, uh, regarding going back, and they, basically Ruth's husband dies. Ruth marries, um, Ruth marries, the Israelite that goes into Moab has two sons, and the two sons marry two women in Moab. Um, Orpah was one, and Ruth was the other. So Naomi then would be the mother-in-law of Ruth. And Naomi says, well, you just, why don't you just stay here? I mean, uh, I, Naomi says, I'm going to go back to Israel and you, uh, Ruth, and you, Orpah, your husbands are dead, so why don't you just stay here with your people? But Ruth shows she has faith in the God of Israel, not in these other gods. And in Ruth 1.16, Ruth 1.16, Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. So in Ruth 1.16, uh, yeah, in Ruth 1.16, Ruth shows she is going to serve the God of Israel. So what you've got here is the reverse. You've got Israel came out of Egypt and went into the promised land and God told them, don't marry these women from these other nations because they're serving other gods. They'll lead your heart astray. You want to make sure you marry only Israelite women and then everybody serves the God of Israel. But by the time you get to Judges, things are so bad that you've got Israel, they just serve Baal and Ashtaroth, they serve these other gods, as we saw in the book of Judges. And so Israel isn't that shining example. So here you've got an Israelite man from Bethlehem goes into Moab with his, uh, uh, his two sons and his wife. The two sons marry two Moabite women, and the Moabite woman is the one who says, I'm going to serve the God of Israel. So it's just the opposite. Before God said, don't marry the foreman women, they'll lead you to serve other gods. But here, it's Israel who is serving other gods, and the Moabitess woman get, leads them to serve the God of Israel. So it's the reverse there. Uh, it, it shows, it's another example of how bad Israel has gotten. That uh, the Gentiles, I mean, Look at what God did. He gave Israel, led them out of Egypt with these special plagues that he sent against the Egyptians, uh, great deliverance through the Red Sea, gave him his law. I mean, there are all these things that shows God of Israel is the only true God and he is with the nation of Israel. And yet it's Israel who forsakes them, the God of Israel. And here's a Moabitess woman who serves God. 
So it shows you there is still hope for the believing remnant, basically, there. Uh, so, um, let's see. So you see, you see from there, from uh, Ruth's statement there in what Romans, or not Romans, Ruth 1.16, that she says, uh, thy people shall be my people, thy God, my God. And what she's doing there, she knows, basically Ruth is following the Abrahamic covenant. If you go over to Genesis chapter 12, for Israel's program, this is how God says he will deal with the nations. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, when God creates the nation of Israel with Abram, he separates Abram out from among his people. He says, go to a land that I will give you, that I will show you. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, so that's Israel there, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Now verse 3 tells you how the Gentiles relate to this. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So if you're a Gentile like Ruth is, on the wrong side of the middle wall partition, a Moabitess on top of that, they can't even enter into the God's, that, that temple, that area there, um, because being under that curse, being part of that Balaam rebellion with uh, trying to curse Israel, um, he or she, the way she would get into salvation under Israel's program in that condition is bless Israel. I will bless him that bless bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curses thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And that's you see that with Ruth uh, in verse uh, sixteen, where she says, Ruth chapter one verse sixteen. I will go. You know, basically, Naomi is leaving Moab, and she is going to dwell back in Israel. And uh, she tells Orpah, verse fourteen, and Ruth. You see in verse 14, they lift up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. Orpah made the choice that she would stay in Moab. Basically, Orpah is going to basically be a Gentile unbeliever. Ruth, you think of a woman back then, you'd have to, it's not like you could go, you know, get your bachelor's degree and support yourself, you know, get a college degree and support yourself at a professional level. I mean, you really needed a man to take care of you. And Ruth didn't have a man. Her husband is dead. Um, and so she's going with a woman, Naomi. Now, Naomi, I guess, is thinking, well, I've got relatives there uh, in that area that will help me out. Uh, and she can do that. But Ruth really doesn't have any ties. I mean, technically, you could say Ruth is a Jew. She's a Jew by marriage and because she married this Jewish guy. But now the Jewish guy is dead. She's not really considered a Jew anymore. She's back to Gentile status and she doesn't have associations with uh, a Jewish man. But yet she recognizes the God of Israel is the true God. And so by Orpah uh, kisses her, basically says, you know, we'll miss, I'll miss you, miss my mother-in-law, miss Naomi. Uh, she stays in Moab, but Ruth clave unto her. And the re you notice verse 15, Naomi said to Ruth, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. This isn't just, am I, in other words, Ruth's decision isn't, am I going to go with my mother-in-law or am I going to stay with my people? The decision is, who is the true God? Who am I going to put? Because I can't place myself under a man because my husband's dead. So I'm, Ruth is making the decision and Orpah is making the decision, what God am I going to trust in to help me? Now that I don't have a husband, it's not like I can go and you know, become a finance director of a corporation. You, you, you know, Women couldn't do that back then. You had to rely on a man. So now that you don't have a man, then what you do is, what God are you going to rely on? So this is really a choice of who do you trust in? Do you trust in the gods that you grew up with, the Moabites, or are you going to trust in the God of Israel? 
Orpah, it says there in verse 15, Naomi says, she went back unto her people and unto her gods. And verse 16, Ruth said, and treat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, thy God, my God. So she's stepping out. You know, that's a very, it's a very difficult thing to do, especially for a woman who doesn't really have any means to support herself to leave what little family she has. I mean, you could say Naomi is her family, but that was just a mother-in-law. And now that the marriage is dissolved due to her husband being dead, she's not really related to her anymore. Her only relations, blood-wise, is in the land of Moab. And that's why Orpah stays there. But Ruth recognizes, evidently, recognizes the Abrahamic covenant and says, God of Israel is the true God. He will bless me if I'm with his people. So I'm going to go with you, Naomi, because you are a Jew, you are God's people, and thy God is going to be my God. So really the choice here, I mean, there is some family choice, but ultimately with a woman without a husband who she's going to trust in God just to be her her savior here to help her. And Orpah chooses the Moabite gods and Ruth chooses the God of Israel. So this is, a, this is not just some family decision as well as this is the best place to live. This is a decision, it's a spiritual decision is my point. And you can see that from the verses, from the, what Naomi says in verse 15 and what Ruth responds with in verse 16. Uh, verse 17, she says, "'Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee in me. Well, now she's calling him the Lord. It's not just the God of Israel, but it's the Lord. That's the one who's over everything. Ultimately, that's Jesus Christ. So, um, so it's, this is definitely a spiritual choice by Ruth. She recognizes she's basically believing in the God of Israel. She recognizes the Abrahamic covenant that God of Israel is the only true God. He is my Lord. He will bless me if I bless Israel. Therefore, I'm going to Israel uh, and trusting in God, basically, is the choice there. Um, and so when they come, verse 22, of course, from verse 1, the man, which was Naomi's husband, who is also dead by now, is from Bethlehem, Judah. And Ruth 1, 22, it says, So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law. So she's called the Moabitess because she is no longer married to the Jewish husband due to his death. So while Ruth is a Jew by marriage, with the marriage being dissolved upon the husband's death, she now returns to being a Moabitess. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. So Bethlehem, going back to where Naomi's husband was from, and again, that is where Jesus was born. Not, not a coincidence, I don't think, because remember, Ruth is representing um, believing Israel. Boaz represents Jesus Christ. Now, of course, they don't know Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem. That prophecy comes in Micah, and Micah is still hundreds of years into the future before they learn that. Uh, but, um, you know, God has a way of working these things out. Let's just put it that way. God's, God's got his sovereign plan. And while there were free will decisions made by Ruth and Naomi and these people, uh, I'm sure God was doing things behind the scenes because, again, what are you going to do? Remember, this is in the time of Judges. For me today, God doesn't need to manipulate circumstances. Because even if nobody believes God's word is true, I can believe it. The Holy Ghost can teach it to me. I don't have to go to a church. I don't have to, you know, I can, the, I've got all three members of the Godhead working for me when I read my Bible. And I can have Christ live in me and live by the faith of the Son of God if no one else does. But remember the situation here in Israel, that's not the case. God didn't dwell within the heart of the believer back then. He dwelt in a temple. The temple is in Israel. Uh, how are you going to get what God's word says unless the Levitical priest teaches it to you? And how are you going to find one who's not corrupt? Well, remember Hebrews 11.6? Hebrews 11.6 says, God is a rewarder 
of those who diligently seek Him. God rewards those who diligently seek Him. It says, without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to Him must believe that He is, and that He is, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So Ruth, what is she going to do? She's a woman, she's disadvantaged. She's a Gentile, she's disadvantaged. She's a Moabitess under a curse that can't come to the temple, and yet she believes in God. So, it's like she's got every circumstance possible is against her, but God says, without faith it is impossible to please him. Evidently, Ruth has faith in the God of Israel, the Abrahamic covenant, based upon her statement in Ruth 1, 16 and 17. So, God's going to reward her for diligently seeking him, and it will end up being Mary and Boaz, who represents Jesus Christ, and shows how that believing remnant, Ruth representing the believing remnant of Israel, uh, they will be rewarded for coming out of the apostate nation, which is in the major majority, believing Israel in the minority, so believing Israel will be rewarded um, for coming out of that apostate nation, just like Ruth is rewarded for diligently seeking God and having Boaz then to be that what's called kinsman redeemer, which we'll probably get to next week, I would think. Okay, so uh, now Ruth uh, chapter 2. Another disadvantage. So if you want to list the disadvantages of Ruth, uh, so first off, she is a, uh, a woman. She is uh, a Gentile. She is of Moab, which is under that special curse, thanks to Balaam, uh, curse there, to the tenth generation. We read that in Nehemiah 13. And now we're going to find out in Ruth 2, 1 through 3, and this is probably a result of the first three, she is also poor. Uh, Ruth chapter 2, verse 1. Ruth chapter 2, verse 1. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. If, you know, if you understand that Ruth represents believing Israel and Boaz represents Jesus Christ, you, know, you can see some of these parallels here. We're only going to go to Jesus to get fed. And going to Jesus, I shall find grace. I mean, you know, you don't, if you don't know the parallels, you, you won't get that. But you'll notice as we go through Ruth, if you read it carefully and you keep in mind who Ruth represents and who Boaz represents, the wording here will be similar to how God loved Israel by sending Jesus to come and die for their sins. And the grace that comes from Jesus. John 1 says that Jesus is full of grace and truth. Spiritually speaking, then the truth would be that food, the spiritual food. And the grace, full of grace and truth, well here, she's going to find grace from Boaz. So it, you'll see those parallels as we go on, you know, if you look at it carefully. Uh, verse 3, she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap, mean, hap means... Uh, by chance. Uh, it just happenstance. She just happened. This happened. <laughs> this happened to happen. <laughs> uh, went in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. So, um, she just happened to be there. And you say, well, really? Is that what, how it is? Or is this God rewarding those who diligently seek him? Well, I think it's both. Uh, I mean, it's for her, she didn't plan it. She didn't know anything about that. That's just how it happened. But God, again, God is working. He's got, because God has that fleshly covenant with Israel, he'll manipulate circumstances and do things for those who seek him. Uh, so that's what I think is going on here. So you can see the disadvantages that she has. A woman, a Gentile of Moab, which is under the curse, and she's poor. Uh, and but you you think of what what uh, Paul says over there in First Corinthians uh, for us today. Uh, First Corinthians, 
I can find it. No, uh, I don't think that's what I want. I think I wanted Second Corinthians, maybe. No, no, it's it's First Corinthians. Uh, I just gotta find it. Okay, here it is. First Corinthians one twenty six. First Corinthians chapter one twenty six. In fact, let's go through verse 29. So you see Ruth as being about as disadvantaged as you can get, but that's really, that's really the people God uses a lot of times. 1 Corinthians 1, 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. The, the, the problem, Israel had that favorite nation status. They weren't supposed to marry foreign women because they'd lead them to serve other gods. But yet what ends up happening is, the Israelite is serving other gods, and it's the foreign woman, Ruth, who serves the God of Israel. It's reversed. Why? Because when Israel gets that favor nation status and they're blessed in the land, as we saw in Judges, when everything's going great, they forget about the God of Israel. They go serve Baal and Ashtaroth. They don't care about God. They just go in after the material things. So when material things are going well, they don't turn to God. It's just like, it's the same thing today. You can try to share the gospel with a family member all their lives, and they won't hear a thing about it. But when they're on their deathbed, they'll listen. Maybe they'll believe. Hopefully they will. A lot of them will at that time when they wouldn't believe before. Uh, Lana's grandmother, I, I shared the gospel with. You know, She was the one that said that um, she, she was okay because her father was the one that helped build the Methodist church down the road where they lived. So she was going to be okay. But the last time I saw her in the hospital, I gave her the gospel and asked if she believed it. She said yes. Now, she had dementia. I don't know if she believed it. I know I shared it a couple other times before with her. Um, but she said, she, you know, she believed it. But before then, she wouldn't listen to it. Because, you know, everything's fine, he physically speaking. Um, Lana's uncle, same way. He wouldn't believe. But yet, in that last couple weeks of his life, he agreed and believed the gospel. So um, it seems like when things are going well in the flesh, that's what you trust in. But when you don't have anything going for you in the flesh, then you turn to the only thing you can do, which is God. And so that's why it says there, you know, not many are wise after the flesh, verse 26, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Usually it's the foolish things. Verse 28, it's the base things, the things which are despised that no flesh should glory in his presence. And you can't get any more base in Israel's program than this. Woman, under the curse. Um, Gentile, on the wrong side of the middle wall partition. Moab, under the curse. And she's poor. I mean, <laughs> she doesn't have anything going for her in this world. But what ends up happening is, it is the, God has chosen, God has chosen, the foolish, the base, the despised, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Ruth can never say, I made it into the God's eternal kingdom because I was wealthy, because I was blessed by God, because God loved me and all that. She had all this going against her. There was nothing in her flesh that she could glory in. She had to say, it's all God that saved me. And it's not just salvation that he, she gets. Because think of this. Look at this example here. To show you how, how amazing Ruth is. Look over in uh, Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. This is talking about the, um, the kingdom, the millennial kingdom. And... In the millennial kingdom, you've got oh, and the Lord Jesus Christ is going to set up the kingdom on earth. He's going to be king of kings and Lord of lords. So Jesus 
is going to be king. Uh, look at Ezekiel 37, 23, uh, and, and 24. Oh, look at that. So Ezekiel 37, 23 and 24. So talking about Israel now, Jesus' second coming, they're in the land. God set up his kingdom on earth through Jesus Christ. In Ezekiel 27, 33, uh, 23, Ezekiel 37, verse 23 says, Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, but I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. And of course, that God there is the Lord Jesus Christ sitting on that throne. And David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. So when you look at the kingdom for Israel, God's kingdom on earth, of course you got Jesus as king, and then you've got David as prince. It says king there, but if you go down to verse 25, uh, at the very end, it says, My servant David shall be their prince forever. So, I mean, obviously, Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus is far above all those powers. He's the one over all. David is not on a level playing field with Jesus, in other words. So Jesus as king, David as prince. When you look at the all the Jews who have ever lived, basically, the two highest positions... In Israel's kingdom, God's eternal kingdom on earth, belong to Jesus, number one, and number two, David. And then you got the 12 apostles sitting on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But these are your top two guys in that, in that kingdom program, God's eternal kingdom on earth. Jesus and David. Okay. Now, with that in mind, look in the last chapter of the book of Ruth. Last chapter of the book of Ruth, we're going to skip to the end. And of course, we'll go back to chapter 2. But I just wanted you to see this here. Very end here, it says... Uh, well, we'll just look at verse 17. We won't read all these names. Ruth 4, Ruth chapter 4, verse 17. So Naomi has a boy, it says. It's uh, not Naomi, Ruth has a boy. It says the son is born to Naomi, but really Naomi is their grand the grandmother. The mother is Ruth. Um, so uh, you see in verse 13, go back to Ruth 4.13. Ruth 4.13, so Boaz took Ruth and she was his wife and when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception and she bare a son. Interesting, the Lord gave her conception, she bare a son. What happened with Mary? The Lord gave her conception, she bare a son. Now, of course, God is the father in that case here. Boaz is the father here. But it's still similar language. Anyway, uh, Ruth has a son. And verse 17 tells you, the women, uh, her neighbors, gave it a name saying, there is a son born to Naomi. They called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. So Ruth gave birth to Obed, who gave birth to Jesse, who gave birth to David, which makes Ruth the great-grandmother of David. Go to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. The two most important men in the lineage, and, and I, I guess we should throw Abraham in here as well, Jesus and David ruling, but Abraham really has a high position too, and I'm not sure exactly how he fits in because Ezekiel 37 didn't tell us, but he is important. The two most important men in, uh, in your Old Testament before Jesus is Abraham, because that's where God started the nation in Genesis 12 and gave all those promises, and then David. And you see in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You can put in a concordant son of David and you'll see that pop up a lot. A lot. Have mercy upon me, thou son of David. That's a big distinction because David was given the basically to be an eternal king. Of God. God gave the king, kingdom to Saul. Saul due to his unbelief. He took the kingdom away from Saul, gave it to David, and gave him an eternal covenant. And he said, 
uh, that you will be my king forever and your son will be as well. Well, that son, not Solomon, that son is Jesus Christ. And you see that in Ezekiel 37, Jesus and David. So here, Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And you have this genealogy here going all the way down to, uh, to Jesus. And you see in verse 5, uh, Matthew 1 verse 5, Salmon beget Booz, that's Boaz. The Greek is a little different from the Hebrew, so that's Boaz. Salmon beget Booz of Rechab, and Booz beget Obed of Ruth, and Obed beget Jesse. So there's Ruth mentioned. There are only, I think, three, I want to say three women mentioned in this genealogy. Ruth is one of them. Um, it shows you how important she is. So you look at it, Ruth is got all the disadvantages, physically speaking. Being a woman, being a Gentile, being under the curse of the Moabites, being poor. And yet because she says, your God will be my God, your people will be my people, I'm trusting in the Lord basically. As a result, she gives birth to Obed, becomes the great-grandmother of David, and she's in that line there. So here is... So my point is, she's got all these disadvantages, but yet in God's eternal kingdom, the two people that reign the highest, at least in Ezekiel 37, is Jesus as king and David as prince. And both of them came through Ruth. So that shows the great blessing that Ruth has. What does what it say? You know, the woman being under the curse because she ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... So she's got that, that curse and she's subject, subject to the man. But what does 1 Timothy 2 say? 1 Timothy 2, verse, uh, look at verses 12 through 15. 1 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2, verses 12 through 15. 1 Timothy 2, verse 12. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. She's under that curse. Why? Two reasons. One, verse 13, Adam was first formed in Eve. So since Adam came first, he's over her. Second, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now notice verse 15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved. So she's saved from this curse of this lower position in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. You won't find any better examples of a woman being saved in childbearing than Ruth because she, gives, she is the great-grandmother of David the king and she is in that line of Jesus. It comes, it comes through Ruth. And so Ruth is in this very disadvantaged status, but she has great blessings in that coming through her line there are the two most important people in that eternal kingdom on earth, David and Jesus. And they come from a Gentile Moabitess woman under the curse who's poor. As I, in other words, the world, it's that 1 Corinthians, that's why I read 1 Corinthians 1.26. The base things, the things that are despised, if you took a world view and you say, you look at this, you look at Ruth, you know, how, is, how valuable she, is she? In the world's view back then in that culture, she's worthless. She doesn't have anything. She doesn't have a man. She's not on the she's on the wrong side of the middle wall partition. She's in a cursed nation on top of that, and she's poor. She's got nothing going for her in this world. And yet in God's eternal kingdom, she is saved through childbearing, having the two most important people in that kingdom, Jesus as king and David as prince, and they came through Ruth. It shows the great blessing that God takes the people who are considered base, who are considered despised, the people that God will, that the world will throw away. And God exalts Ruth greatly in having these men who can... By the way, Jesus and David, oh, they continued in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety. They fit that category. So she is safe from the curse and has great blessings in God's eternal kingdom on earth despite her disadvantages in the flesh. Because... She says, she just says, God will be my God and your people will be my people. Um, and by the way, that's a lot harder for a woman to do 
when she doesn't have a husband to take care of her, she doesn't have a father. I mean, she is just her and her mother-in-law. That's it. And she's going to go to a nation she's never been to, pro probably. I mean, a Jewish male was supposed to appear before the Lord three times a year. I doubt this guy did it if he was in Moab. Um, so she's probably never been there. And, uh, and yet she's just having faith that, this, that the God of Israel is the true God. And God gives her a great blessing for that. So now we'll go through that story there in Ruth chapter 2. We'll see how that all comes about. Um, we can see uh, it's setting you up there. There is a term we should probably talk about next, and that is the term of the, the kinsman redeemer. Let's, uh, I'll leave that up there. And we'll see this more in uh, chapter 4. But to give you an introduction, you, you see here in Ruth 2 and verse 3, the reason that Boaz represents Christ is because he is a, a type of Jesus Christ as being the kinsman redeemer. You see from Ruth chapter 2 verse 3, she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap, by chance, was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And we learn from, you go back to Ruth 1.1, 1, 1, the man of Bethlehem Judah who went and sojourned in Moab. Verse 2 says, in Ruth chapter 1, verse 2, the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi. So when you see that Boaz is related to Elimelech, Elimelech would have been what the great grandfather in law of Ruth? Is that right? Or just the, no, the father in law. It'd been the father in law because Ruth married Elimelech's son. So Elimelech would be Ruth's father in law. So uh, Boaz is of the kindred of Ruth's father in law. Uh, verse 20, uh, Ruth chapter 2, verse 20. Uh, Naomi said unto her regarding Boaz, uh, said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man, Boaz, is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. So we learn from Ruth chapter three, 2, verse 3 and verse 20 that Boaz is, let's say near kins. Near kins, one of our next kinsmen, is uh, is kinsman to Ruth, and we'll get to that more in chapter four. But Jesus Christ, the reason he had to become a man, is because that way he could be that kinsman redeemer. In fact, look over in Hebrews ten. I, I want you to you need to see that it's important that. That Boaz, in other words, for Boaz to represent Jesus Christ, he had to fit certain criteria. He had to be that kinsman redeemer. Uh, look in Hebrews 10, you notice with Jesus Christ here, it gives you this clue here. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. Hebrews 10, verse 4, and we'll go down through verse uh, 8. Verse 8. So Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. Hebrews 10 verse 4 says, It is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. I mean, they're sacrificing bulls and goats every single year, uh, and more, much more often than that in the Mosaic law. But yet all it did was, according to Hebrews 9.13, is it purified the flesh. Hebrews 9.14 says the blood of Christ purges the conscience or purges the soul. Well, why is that? Because the blood of bulls and goats isn't related to you. I mean, it's an animal, it has life, but it doesn't have a soul like we do. Uh, animal doesn't have that. Man, uh, it was in Genesis 2, the God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Man did not do that with any of the animals. The animals, he just created the animals. They, but with man, God actually breathed his 
breath, breath being in the Holy Spirit, the breathing that breath of God into man's nostrils and making him a living soul. So man has that soul that lives forever, whereas an animal doesn't. So if an animal's blood is shed for your sins, well, that only covers the flesh. It doesn't cover the soul because they don't have... God never breathed into the nostrils of a bull or of a goat the breath of life to, for them to become a living soul. They don't have that living soul like man does. So it says, It is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Verse 5 now, Hebrews 10, verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. In other words, God isn't saying, Okay, Jesus, make sure you sacrifice a thousand bulls and ten thousand goats. Now it says, That's not what I brought you into the world for. But a body hast thou prepared me. You've got a body. You are fully man, fully God, but also fully man. Jesus had to be fully man to be our kinsman redeemer. The blood of bulls and goats can't take away your sins because they don't have a living soul like you do. But if Jesus Christ is fully man, then he has a living soul. So when his blood is shed, it can be the sacrifice to redeem us. So verse 6, Hebrews 10, 6, And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. Verse 8, above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. So what you learn there, Hebrews 10, 4 through 8, it took a human sacrifice to save us from our sins. And that right there, this is what makes Jesus our kinsman redeemer. He is kin to us in that he is a human just like us. Now I know for Israel it goes a step further because he is also a Jew. So then that allows him to save the Jews as well. Um, and that was that's a whole other study. I won't go into all the details of that, but there was a there was a plan under Israel's program for Jesus to save Israel from their sins. Um, but it's not till after you get to Paul that you find out, well, it's really both Jews and Gentiles that God had in mind, not just the Jews, not just Israel's program. There was this mystery program reconciling the heaven back to himself through the body of Christ. So, uh, but the point is, Jesus had to be fully man because it takes the blood of a human, a perfect human, and we'll go through all that when we get to Ruth 4. It takes the blood of a human to save us from our sins, not the blood of bulls and of goats. And so that's how Jesus is a kin. He's not just a redeemer. Because you could say that the bull and the goat is a redeemer too. But they can't save you from, their sin, from your sins because the bull and a goat is not a kinsman redeemer. It doesn't have a soul like you do. So Jesus had to be fully man, in addition to being fully God, to be our kinsman redeemer. And since Boaz represents Jesus Christ, that's why Ruth chapter 2 verse 3 and verse 20 points it out to make sure you understand that Boaz is kinsman to Ruth. I mean, Ruth could have married any Jew and, you know, she would have been in a good state. She would have been a Jew and, you know, been in that, uh, you know, been in a better status there in Israel there as a woman married to a uh, to an Israelite to a Jew but the fact that she is married or Boaz is the kinsman then he can be the kinsman redeemer and that way he can represent Jesus Christ that's so that's very important to understand he's not just some Jew there he's near kin to Ruth and Jesus isn't just some Jew. He is the kinsman, or some human, I should say. He's the kinsman redeemer. Uh, he has uh, got that living soul like us. Okay, so uh, Jesus being the kinsman redeemer, I wanted to show you that. Uh, and let's look at, since we're in Ruth, let's look at a couple of uh, Old Testament passages. Job 19 
25, Job 19, verse 25, and Psalm 19, verse 14, yeah, 19, verse 14. Those are the two passages that refer to Jesus. Well, you don't know it's Jesus, but we do now. You know, they didn't know it back then, but they knew the Messiah would be a Redeemer. Uh, Job 19, verse 25. Job is the first book, probably the first book uh, the, of the Bible that was written before the book of Genesis. And yet, here you got this statement here in Job chapter 19. Job chapter 19 and verse 25. Uh, it says, Job says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. He's not just saying my Messiah is going to come, my Savior. He says my Redeemer. In other words, the problem is that I was, you know, Adam. You look at Adam. He's God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. Then Adam eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So now the living soul becomes a dead soul. So now the soul has to be redeemed. And Job, of course, by God showing him this, uh, knows that God is going to be that redeemer for him. My, he says, my redeemer liveth, and he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Job 19, 25. And then the other one was Psalm 19 and verse 14. Psalm 19 and verse 14. Uh, Psalm 19, verse 14, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. So I bring this up to show you that even in the Old Testament, there are clues to tell you that uh, God will be the Redeemer of man. Man being basically, uh, you think of someone who is redeemed like a, like a, a, a bond issue, it's an, in, I know the financial term, so I'll use that. You've got, say, a bond issue is a debt. So you've got, uh, say, a million dollars in bonds. So you've issued these bonds, which is debt. Uh, the company issues them. And so the company owes that money. And they're obligated, usually the way it works in corporate world, is you've got a 30-year obligation. So uh, you pay interest for 30 years, and then at the end of the 30 years, you pay off the, the principal after the 30 years. But if you say, say now the company is doing really well and they want to get rid of their debt, they may have provisions in there where they can do a bond redemption. They redeem the bonds. So now they, and whatever the provisions are on the bond, will cover that. But basically it means we don't have to wait for the 30 years. We can pay the debt right now. So... Uh, let's say after five years, you can do a bond redemption. And so you fulfill, you know, whatever the covenant of the bond is. And so now you're supposed to have 30 years. But instead, you fulfill the provision of the bond by doing a bond redemption. And after five years, the debt is paid. So um, that's just an illustration to think of that term redeemer. You think, well, what's the difference between a redeemer and Messiah or the Savior? Well, you think of us. What's our issue? We have, a, we have a sin debt. And the obligation of that isn't 30 years. It's uh, eternity in a lake of fire. Not 30 years, but eternity in a lake of fire. Jesus, we, and the reason is because we can't pay the debt. We can never pay... You know, the, the reason that the bond issue ends after 30 years is because you pay off the principal. So let's say, uh, let's say, so a million dollars I said, okay? So what you do is, all these people give you, the company, a million dollars. And then you agree to pay, let's say, 6% interest every year for 30 years. So you do that for the 30 years, then in the end, you pay them the million dollars back. So they're getting the 6% interest for 30 years, and then they also get the million dollars, okay? With us, spiritually speaking, we've got a sin debt, and you can't measure it in dollars, but basically the issue is we can't make it a 30-year term 
because we have no ability to redeem, to pay it at the end. We can't make that principal payment. You know, in terms of finances, you might say this is a, you know, a, a zillion dollars, which is a figure that doesn't exist, but some astronomical amount, you know, a zillion, gazillion dollars, you can't pay it. So because you can't pay it, you're forever in debt. See, the only reason they get out of debt with this bond issue after 30 years is because they pay back their original principal plus the interest. With your sin debt, you can never, ever pay. You don't have the ability. So that's why it doesn't expire in 30 years. That's why you spend eternity in the lake of fire. Now, in the case of the bond redemption, I mentioned, well, if you've got the money after five years and the provisions, you can just pay it off now. You don't have to wait another 25 years. Well, you think of Jesus. I don't have the ability to pay off my sin debt, which is why I would spend eternity in the lake of fire. But Jesus' righteousness overcomes death. Death is conquered by his life. 1 Corinthians 15 says, uh, death is swallowed up in victory. It says... Uh, uh, praise be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he is the one who is able to redeem it. The bond redemption, he can redeem our sin debt. We would spend eternity in the lake of fire never being able to pay our sin debt, but Jesus Christ's righteousness swallows up death. Death swallowed up in victory. His life overcomes the death. So he is basically like that bond redeemer. He says, here is your debt that you owe the principal that you owe, which for us is the sin debt, and he says, I'm going to pay that principal. In other words, I'm doing the redemption. The bond redemption? Well, here, Jesus does the soul redemption. So in a bond redemption, you would have to pay it off in 30 years, but you got the money now, so you pay it off after the five years. So now it's done. You don't ever have to owe that thing again. With Jesus... Of course, my, I always owe it. I'll never be able to pay it off. So Jesus comes in. He can pay it off. He pays my sin debt the moment I trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sin. So now he has redeemed my soul. There is no debt payment that I owe, which means I don't have to go to the lake of fire. So that's where, hopefully, that, that gives you an understanding of what it means to be the Redeemer. So in the financial world, you can see it. A debt is owed. You pay that debt in advance. The redemption is made. Jesus, we owe a sin debt. Jesus pays that sin debt by his life, his righteousness, conquering that. And so that debt is no longer paid, uh, no longer due. It is redeemed. It is no longer due. It's redeemed. So Jesus, uh, Job 19.25, my Redeemer liveth. Psalm 19.14, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And then if you go to Matthew chapter 1 now, Matthew chapter 1. So here's Jesus being born. And actually, this is the first time that he has given that name Jesus. Uh, you don't know that in beforehand until you get to this point. And here is uh, Joseph. And an angel, Gabriel, appears to Joseph. And he says in verse 20, uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. While he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? Name Jesus? For he shall save his people, that's Israel, save his people from their sins. In other words, here's my sin debt. Jesus is going to pay it. He's going to be my redeemer. So you see that there from Matthew 1 and verse 21. So Job 19, 25, my redeemer liveth. Psalm 19, 14, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And now we see the prophecy of that redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. And so you think of um, Ruth, what is her debt? Well, she's a woman, she's a Gentile, she's under the curse of Moab, and she's poor. And all of that is gone away by the Redeemer, Boaz, but it is a kinsman Redeemer, because remember, it's not just good enough to have 
blood shed for, you know, in the case of Jesus here, you can't just shed the blood of bulls and goats to pay for your sins because they don't have a soul like we do. So we had to have Jesus as our kinsman redeemer to make that payment. The blood of bulls and goats, he sprinkled that blood on our soul. That doesn't do any good. It can't take away our sins. It can't pay the sin debt. Uh, but Jesus could. So uh, that's where that kinsman redeemer comes in. And hopefully you understand what the term redeemer means now. I mean, a lot of times, the problem is a lot of us, including myself, you grow up in church and you hear that term and you say, well, Jesus, is he your redeemer? Yeah, but you probably couldn't tell anybody what it means because that's just what you're told and you just believe it and that's what the Bible says. So that's good, but hopefully that helps you understand what a redeemer is all about. And we'll get more of that when we get to Ruth chapter 4, which will probably be next week. Okay, so uh, let's see. So we're in Ruth chapter 2. Uh, we see from verse 3 that Boaz is a near kinsman. Oh, the kinsman redeemer law. I wanted to show you that too. Um, that's important in all this. Look at Leviticus 25. There is a provision under the law for uh, someone to be redeemed. Uh, so Leviticus 25. Um, verse uh, 47 and 48. Leviticus 25, verses 47 and 48. Just so you can see the re that there is a redemption law in the, in the Mosaic law, in that Levitical law. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 47. Leviticus 25, verse 47. And if a sojourner or stranger wax rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him wax poor, there's Ruth, she's poor, and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner by thee, or to the stock of the stranger's family. After that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. Uh, either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him, or if he be able, he may redeem himself. So there is a redemption law that you're, um, you're sold into slavery, but for uh, you know, whatever reason, there is the ability of yourself or someone else to uh, basically a kinsman. You notice verse 49, the uncle, the uncle's son, or any that is nigh of kin unto him. So maybe I should put verse 49 as well. So it shows you that there is a provision under the law of a kinsman redeemer. Okay, so going back to Ruth uh, chapter 2. Ruth chapter 2, we're going to see some uh, parallels here in Ruth chapter 2 to uh, Jesus and, uh, and believing Israel. Remember, keep in mind that Ruth represents believing Israel and Boaz represents Jesus Christ. So let's uh, we'll put these down here. Okay, so Ruth chapter 2, um, verse... So she ends up, just happenstance, she ends up being in Boaz's field. Uh, she's gleaning in the field. That shows that she's poor. The law uh, indicated that uh, the poor people... were well, basically, you'd go through your field and you'd get the harvest of the crop, whatever it is, but you wouldn't take the time to get the stuff that's really hard to get out. You know, you'd go through and get the majority of it and you'd leave a small percentage behind. And so then that way, if you're poor, then you would go and what's called glean in the field, where you'd go and find the little pieces of food that were sort of hard to get off of the plant and you'd go get that. And, and actually, you know, what's great about this is it's a wonderful welfare program because you think of today, what they do today in America is they just send you a check. So what does that do? You end up sitting around, you're lazy, you don't do anything. You just wait for your check to come in. But here, the welfare program wasn't, I'm going to send you a check, it's, we're going to give you food, but we're not just going to give you food, you've got to go out and find it. So, 
the people will grow the food and grow the crops and they'll get the vast majority of it, but there's still going to be some food left and it's going to be harder to get. It's going to take more time. But if you are hungry and you need food, this is free food. You go get it, you know. And so that's what she does. It's a wonderful welfare program. Um, it keeps you from being lazy. You have to work to, for your food. Um, so she went and gleaned the field. So that shows she's poor. And she was in Boaz field. And so then Boaz, he, know, he finds out that this kinsman of mine, Ruth, uh, is out there gleaning the field. So then in verse 8, Ruth 2 verse 8, Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Uh, so basically it's uh, Ruth, Boaz in, in 2.8 here, Boaz limits Ruth to his fields. And this is a type of Jesus, type of Jesus protecting believing Israel. You think of what was going on in Jesus' day. You had all these religious leaders who had rejected the commandments of God to keep their own traditions. Uh, Jesus called them serpents, blind guides. He called them hypocrites. He said that you are a generation of vipers, that you cannot escape the damnation of hell. And so he told his disciples, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. He says, You believe God in His Word, and I'm going to teach it to you. But beware of the Pharisees, because they're going to lead you astray. So, I, you know, in other words, stick with my teaching. Stick with God's Word here. And Boaz is sort of doing that in type. Remember where we are in the book of Judges. This is the time of the Judges. We started off, we read that Judges 21, 25, that every man did what was right in his own eyes. We saw last week how evil it had gotten, sort of like Sodom and Gomorrah. So here's a woman out there uh, gleaning in the fields, um, trying to get food. Boaz basically is protecting her. I mean, let's be honest. What we just read last week in Judges 17, um, Ruth, uh, there is a probably a great danger if she happened to glean in the wrong fields that she would be raped or she would be murdered based upon what we see going on in the book of Judges. I mean, just be honest about it. That's, that's the danger. Spiritually speaking, the Pharisees could murder the disciples, spiritually speaking, leading them away from the truth and leading them to the traditions of men. So Jesus protected the disciples, spiritually speaking, and Ruth is protecting, I'm sorry, Boaz is protecting Ruth by saying, don't go outside of my fields because... Who knows what's going to happen out there? I mean, we read it last week. This is a vile, wicked nation in the time of Judges. And for a poor Gentile Moabitess woman who, you know, at least if you were a Jewish woman, maybe you have some rights there. But a Gentile woman in Israel, you don't have anything. I mean, they can just do whatever they want against you, basically. And so Boaz recognizes that and says, you stick with my fields. I, basically what he's saying is, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to keep you safe is what he's saying there. Just like Jesus does with the believing remnant of Israel. Okay, uh, Verse 9 now, he says, Boaz says to Ruth, again continuing, so verse 8, Ruth, Ruth 2, 8, Boaz says, uh, Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens, lest thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? So there's that potential for rape or murder that I mentioned. Have not I charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Uh, so you see there um, in verse 10 now, Then she fell on her face, and bowed herself to the ground, and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? Think of that in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a stranger from God. Your sins have separated you from God. 
Why should God take notice of you? Man or woman, doesn't matter. Because of your sin. I mean, you're subject to the wrath of God for your sin. And yet God commended his love toward us. And then while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He took notice of us. He extended grace to us. Uh, so you see there, this statement by Ruth is very similar to what, um, what we can say today and what uh, basically anybody can say, Israel, believe in Israel. Believe in Israel isn't part of the club, the clique of apostate Israel. They're not following the traditions of the fathers. Why should God take notice of them? But God loves them. He extends grace to them. So, um, so there, the grace there, it also shows. So in Ruth 2, 9 and 10, you've got uh, grace. That's a type. You can see it. Uh, God's grace to basically all believers, regardless of dispensation. But not only that, it also says, she says there in verse 10, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? So uh, it's showing also that there is grace for Gentiles in Israel's program. We saw all the disadvantages of Ruth. I mentioned them up there. She's poor. She's a Moabitess. She's a Gentile. She's a woman. And yet she finds grace from someone. Um, and we mentioned how Rahab in James chapter 2 is commended. She's justified by faith plus works. Even though she's a Gentile a harlot, just like Abraham was justified by faith plus works. She is on the same level, uh, or at least the two examples there in James, justified by faith plus works, is of Abraham, the father of Israel, but also of Rahab, a Gentile harlot, which meant that even in Israel's program, when Israel had favored nation status, even a Gentile could be saved and could be part of that. Uh, so you see that a stranger, and yet Gentiles could still be saved uh, in Israel's program. Verse 11, Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thy husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. Or heretofore. What does God tell to Israel? Uh, look in Revelation uh, uh, Revelation, maybe chapter 21, maybe, chapter 21. No. No, that's not what I wanted. Maybe it's chapter 17. Revelation 18. Here we go. What's the issue with Israel? Remember, Ruth represents believe in Israel that will come out of apostate Israel. All of Israel is called God's people, but then Romans 9 uh, says not all who are called Israel are really all of Israel. Uh, in John 8, you've got the Pharisees. They're Jews, physically speaking, but Jesus says, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. So physically, the Pharisees are Jews, but spiritually they're not because they haven't believed the gospel. And here in Revelation 18, you've got Israel makes a seven-year covenant with the Antichrist, and the call, and they're called Babylon here, and the call to Israel in Revelation 18 verse 4. Revelation 18, 4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. So you've got Revelation 18, 4. Believe in Israel, called out from apostate Israel. Come out from among them, my people and be separate. And what do you have here? Remember I said Ruth represents that, that believe in Israel that will come out of apostate Israel? 
Well, here you see it here in uh, Ruth chapter 2, verse 11. Boaz says, um, How thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity and art come unto a people which thou knewest not here, heretofore. So there, where Ruth represents believing Israel, that would be Ruth chapter 2 and verse 11. She comes out from among the Moabites, the, the, Moab, the Moabs, the Moabs, and she goes and becomes part of Israel. So to the call for Israel is a lot of those Jews are apostate. They're, they make that covenant with the Antichrist. In Jesus' day, a lot of them were aligned with the Pharisees or the Sadducees, those religious leaders. And God says, come out from among them and be separate. He says, come out from them, my people, and be not partakers of their sins. You're going to be punished and subject to God's wrath if you don't believe the gospel of the kingdom and be saved. So there are Jews who have to come out from among the apostate nation to be saved. Similarly, Ruth comes out from a, a apostate nation, you might as well say the Moabites, the Gentiles there, and she becomes part of Israel. So she is a type of believing Israel coming out of apostate Israel there. And uh, you notice verse 12. So verse 11, he says, uh, How thou hast left thy father, thy mother, the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. Verse 12, The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Again, a reference. Ruth isn't just coming to Israel because Naomi's my mother-in-law, I'll do that. It was, no, it was, your people will be my people, your God will be my God. Ruth is making a conscious choice to leave behind the gods of the Moabs and to serve the God of Israel. And Boaz acknowledges that here. He didn't say, oh, you just came because Naomi's your mother-in-law. He says, no, you've, uh, under, uh, it's under the Lord God of Israel, it's under his wings thou art come to trust. You, you, you know, and you think of those wings, I mean, it's not that God has wings, but it's just a, it's a metaphor there because you think of a hen and the chicks. The chicks are, you know, there's, there's danger with uh, something that could, they could be taken, they could be eaten, they could be destroyed, they could be trampled on. And so the hen, the mother hen, puts the chicks under the wings to protect them. And basically that's what it's saying about Ruth. Boaz is saying, basically, you're a Gentile, you're of Moab, you're poor, and you're a woman. So you've come to the God of Israel to trust. To, uh, you've come under His wings. You've come under the Lord God of Israel's protection here. That's the choice you made. You didn't just come to be with your mother-in-law because you liked her. You came to Israel because you recognized you're trusting in the Lord God of Israel. I heard about your statement in Ruth 1.16. Uh, basically, is what he's saying. Uh, so... And so uh, I guess, yeah, we're out of time. So we'll stop there. And next week we'll pick up uh, there after, after Ruth uh, chapter 2 and verse 12. And uh, hopefully we'll finish Ruth next time. So uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for giving us this wonderful uh, picture of the great love that you had for Israel and that uh, you saw those who would trust in you and you protected them, and you're giving them eternal life in God's kingdom on earth as they come out of apostate Israel. Help us, Lord, to see that example and do the same in this world we live in, coming out from among unbelievers, atheism, wicked, evil people, churchianity, all these different systems that are contrary to you and your word. Help us, Lord, to focus on the doctrine that you've given us in Paul's epistles and to use the mind of Christ um, coming out from among the others, the people of this world, so that your love is seen through us so that others may be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.